Focus on Health, brought to you by the Valley Private Hospital, Mulgrave. I have enjoyed this segment here on uh, Sunday Sports Central because uh, every week we learn something about our health and uh, something we cannot uh, take for granted, that is for sure. Professor Richard Bitter, spinal neurosurgeon, is our special guest on the line today. Uh, Professor, welcome. Thank you very much, Brett. Nice to have you on. Now, just to give a little bit of background, you are a neurosurgeon and, and spinal surgeon uh, Precision Brain Spine and, and Pain Centre, precisionhealth.com.au. Just give us a, a bit more into your background. Absolutely. So I, I trained as a neurosurgeon, and a lot of my work is spinal surgery as well as as well as well brain surgery. And we, we see a lot of patients with spinal problems. So we work as part of a, a larger team of pain specialists and neurologists and psychologists out uh, at our various locations, and it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be on here talking about some of the new developments in in spinal surgery uh, that have been happening over the past past few years. Absolutely, and if anyone's got a question too, the lines are open during our segment at the Medical Room, 94291116, and we've enjoyed the listeners' interaction with this segment over the past uh, month. I imagine, uh, Professor, that spinal surgery um, does maybe strike the fear a little bit into people. It sure does. I mean, we we all hear horror stories and a lot of patients know someone who's had an operation and hasn't gone well. And obviously, when you're operating on the spine, people worry about the risk of paralysis. In reality, the risks these days should be very, very low. And there have been so many different changes that have happened in the way that we do the surgery and the way that we prepare for the surgery and the safety measures that we can take during the operation that the risks have come down considerably. I can imagine. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine a lot's changed. I mean, I mean medicine and, and uh, everything to do with health and, and the medical um, industry as a whole, I mean, there's always things evolving. I mean, tell us what has changed over mm-hmm. the last sort of five to ten years, if you like, to yeah, make absolutely. spinal surgery safer. Well, I think before we even get into the operating room, I think we're better at making the diagnosis. And, and, mm. and certainly what I do and, um, and what our team does is we really spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly where the problem's coming from. Because in the past, I think a lot of people that had spinal surgery, maybe they didn't have it in the right place or maybe the right problem wasn't identified. But we've got better quality imaging now. We've got fantastic experts who can put needles and uh, injections of other sorts of local anaesthetic and cortisone in very specific places to establish exactly what the patient's problem is. So I think the key thing is getting the right diagnosis, uh, selecting the patients appropriately for surgery, and then, of course, you get into the operating room and a lot's changed there. I mean, it's like the motor car. Uh, The cars that we drive now are probably a lot different to what we drove 20 years ago. We've got GPS systems in our cars. We've got GPS systems now in our operating theatres that allow us to get to the right place without causing any major problems elsewhere and to do it faster, more efficiently and, and more safely. We've, we're seeing a lot of changes in, in, in terms of the technology that we have in the operating theatre that makes spinal surgery much safer than it, uh, than it was previously. Professor Richard Bidar is our special guest, a spinal neurosurgeon here in the medical room, 94291116. We might just look inside some of those advances. Take me mm-hmm. through keyhole spinal surgery. Mm. Keyhole spinal surgery is something that has really uh, developed um, uh, on, on the basis that if you make a smaller incision, you cause less destruction and damage to other tissues to get to where you need to be. The patients can get up and out of bed and out of hospital much quicker. They have less pain. They get back to work quicker and they get back to, to doing all the things that they, they love doing quicker. So keyhole spinal surgery is a pretty generic term for a wide range of different approaches that we have. But generally speaking, it refers to us making smaller incisions. Uh, we use uh, microscopes and a lot of magnification and a lot of other toys that allow us to remove the problem um, uh, without disrupting the surrounding areas uh, more than we, we absolutely need to. So keyhole spinal surgery you know, has been a major advance for patients. Okay, and more recently, um, Richard, robotic spinal surgery, which is, uh, mm. is really interesting. Yeah, robotic spinal surgery, I think, is the most exciting yeah. thing. And I mean, and it's time I noticed that this, this segment sponsored by the Valley Private Hospital. And, mm. you know, robotic spinal surgery is something... There isn't a robot for spine in Victoria at the moment. There's only one other one in Australia. But 
uh, as far as I'm aware, the Valley Private will be getting a robot um, probably early next year and this treatment will be available to, to Victorians with a handful of surgeons like myself performing this down there. The, the way the robot works is it combines a really space-age GPS-type system with a whole pile of other technological advantages to create almost a an assistant for the surgeon. So the robot helps the surgeon to be more precise to be able to put screws into various parts of the spine to be able to do other things that normally might take a lot longer and normally might be associated with a higher risk. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a risk of human error there. There's a risk of putting the screw in the wrong spot. Now, if you use the robot, the studies that I've seen suggest that the accuracy rates for screw placement go up to 80, uh, go up to 98 or 99 percent, or even more in some in some cases. So okay. what we're what we're getting out of this this robot, and hopefully we will have it, is an opportunity to really reduce the risks of spinal surgery uh, even more, and hopefully make the operation more likely to be successful for our patients. I think you touched on at the start. We were sort of talking about GPS type navigation. I mean, this is all obviously you know to make the surgery as safe as possible. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Just like you can get lost driving down the street, um, you know, if things look, uh, you know, if things have been distorted in the, the spine by a lot of degenerative changes or trauma or other pathology, it's possible to get a little bit uh, lost in the spine as well and in the brain for that matter. And so, what GPS allows us to do is to really know exactly where we are. So within a, a millimetre or two quite often, um, and to, to reduce that chance of wandering off somewhere where you don't want to go and to be able to stay focused on the area that really requires attention. Okay. Uh, if you've got a question for uh, Professor Richard Bittar, spinal neurosurgeon, give us a call, 94291116 in the medical room, thanks to thevalleyprivate.com.au. I want to maybe go back a step uh, Professor, just in terms of mm-hmm. before you actually get into the operating theatre and, and yes. the procedures you sort of got to go through and what that requires. Yeah, look, there are lots of ways of, of assessing patients that have spinal problems. I mean, eighty percent of the population uh, have back pain from time to time. It's it's so very common, and a lot of people have neck pain as well. Fortunately, the vast majority of people don't need surgery or other interventions, and it's really our job to try and work out uh, who might benefit from surgery and who really needs that because we don't want to be operating on people unnecessarily. And I'm very conservative. I try to avoid surgery wherever I can, but ultimately a lot of patients do require it. So if that's the case, we need to really figure out the best way of working out what patient needs surgery and what type of operation they actually need. Now, the spine is complicated. There are a lot of different structures in the spine, it can be difficult to figure out where the pain's coming from. You can't just look at an MRI scan, for example, or just tap someone's reflexes and go, wow, this is exactly where the problem is. Most of the time, you need more information than that. So we we really look at the patient more as a whole. We use a variety of different approaches. We have a, a team of specialists, including pain specialists, neurologists so we can do a variety of different blocks nerve conduction tests we do a whole pile of fancy scans and then i sit down and we synthesize that information so what we then do is we say okay this is where everything is pointing to that the problem is and what can we then do about it i think that's a that seems to me to be you know intuitively a a much safer and much smarter approach to figuring out how to, to manage patients that can be very, very difficult to manage sometimes. Okay. It's just a, an interesting SMS that's uh, come through. I'll just read this out. Guys, I see that Michael Clark, the Australian cricket captain, um, agitates, then uh, pops his back. His reactions and subsequent layoff echo my issues. A uh, L45 uh, bulge that stops me in my tracks uh, every uh, eight or so months. How does the captain of the Australian cricket team not have a solution to his uh, back problems by now? I mean, it's something that has plagued him for a long time, and there's debate whether he's mm. going to continue playing uh, one day cricket uh, because of the strain, or just mm-hmm. uh, remain playing uh, Test cricket. I mean, it's a it's a part of the body that um, I suppose a lot of people never get totally solved, do they? I mean, you see people who have back issues and uh, for uh, you know, a large part of their life. Mm, absolutely, and some people. Do Some people go without finding the right solution to their problem and some people are just unlucky or for genetic reasons or other reasons they 
they don't uh, they don't really get a, a, a great outcome. But for most people that present with a disc prolapse like that, there's usually something we can do to significantly uh, help. It's uncommon to to have patients that we really can't help at all. You've got to remember with with cricketers and other um, you know, professional sportsmen and women, they put their bodies and their spines under a lot of pressure. And the things that might work for you or I in terms of a treatment in the operating theatre, you know, is that going to necessarily stand up to the extra pressure that some of these professional athletes put on themselves? Now, having said that, lots of athletes, I've operated on professional cricketers and other professional athletes that have had disc problems and they've been able to get back to to, to playing at the the, the same sort of level that they were Mm. before. So you can have some success. Um, but it's not just a case of looking at the disc prolapse. You've got to look at all the other stuff around there that might also be contributing to the problem. You talk about the times are changing and, and it will continue to evolve uh, medicine. I mean, if you're looking to your crystal ball, um, Richard, you know, five, ten mm-hmm. years down the track, I mean, how far advanced do you think we'll be in uh, sort of spinal surgery? Well, I think we are. We will be much, uh, much further advanced. I think that we're seeing, I think, things like the robotic spinal surgery and the navigation during surgery uh, will just become more and more uh, accessible to, to specialists and patients in, in a variety of, of hospitals. I think that we're seeing a, a new era of disc replacement where we're treating the neck and in some cases the lower back like a hip or a knee in, in some patients and replacing the discs rather than fusing them. Uh, that's something that's that's evolving and is becoming uh, as being done more commonly. I'm certainly doing that more commonly than I was a few years ago. So I think we're going to see those changes. We're also seeing a lot of money and research being invested in uh, stem cell type treatments as well. You know, stem cells are real buzzword, but there is some work going on and then there's some work going on in Melbourne and, and in other parts of Australia and certainly around the world looking at the application of stem cell therapies to trying to reverse some of the degenerative changes in the spine. And I think that's a really, that would be so exciting if, if, if we could put a needle in the spine and inject some stem cells and take a disc that was breaking down and give it life again and try to restore it back to its, uh, its pre-degenerate um, uh, or pre-injury level. That would be sensational. So I think a lot of things are going to happen in those areas uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to spinal surgery, I think our ability to diagnose problems, I think that's going to increase. You know, we're seeing neuromodulation. We're seeing the use of spinal cord stimulators and mm. other types of nerve stimulators that we can apply to patients that might have chronic back pain or leg pain, and they have a, a good success rate. And you know, they don't they don't generally cure people, but in most patients, you can reduce their pain levels significantly to the point where they would turn around and say, well, look, I'm glad I had the operation and I'd have it again. So you've got to have a whole pile of different tools at your disposal. You've got to come at the spine from multiple different angles. And it's often not a case of just finding one particular treatment and hoping that's going to do the job. Some some patients, it may be a combination of therapies. And that's that's really why you need a team. You can't just be a uh, you know, do this as one person. You, you've got to adopt a team approach to try and manage these problems. And you've got to have access to the best technology. Yep. Absolutely. And I was, I was going to finish on that. I mean, for people out there listening in, and the medical room has been a, a popular segment with our SEN listeners, what are a couple of key messages you can leave us with? Because, I mean, people in this situation would want to be getting more than just mm. one opinion, I'd imagine. Absolutely. I, I think second opinions are critical. If anyone recommends surgery, I, I'm very happy for my patients to get second opinions, and I think patients generally should not. I would get a second opinion myself. I think the other key thing here is if you go back to you know, everyone thinks you've got to go to the big city hospitals, you've got to go to Cabrini or Epworth to be able to get access to the best specialists and, and the best technology. Well, maybe that was the case uh, a while ago, but if you go back to the mid-90s when the Kennett government was reorganising health services, um, Neil Henderson, who's now CEO of the Valley Private, was heading up a committee there and, and they really oversaw and uh, came up with the uh, uh, development of these regional um, uh, networks. So they took about 35 or 36 independent public hospitals and they put them into uh, groups. And that allowed a lot of specialised services to be able to be delivered to patients closer to where they live. It's It's actually unusual, but it's taken the private sector some time to catch up with that. 
And what we're seeing now, and, and the Valley is a great example, it's, it's arguably one of the best placed private hospitals and, you know, with investing in some really good technology. But we're seeing, you know, a hospital like that, for example, that's invested tens of millions of dollars in technology. Mm. So patients can go and have these uh, procedures. They can be treated closer to where they live. They don't need to drive all the way into the city for these things. So I think local access, and if you've got a spine problem or if you've got a brain problem, you don't want to have to be travelling long distances if you can avoid it. So the take-home messages are get a second opinion, look for a team. Don't just look for one person, but look for a whole team of people that can uh, apply all of their uh, energy to trying to figure out what's wrong with you and help you. And don't assume that the specialists and the technologies are not available in some of these um, uh, hospitals that are located around Melbourne because what we're seeing now, and the robot's a great example, is we're seeing some of these hospitals like the Valley uh, really lead the way in, in, in that regard. Very interesting stuff. Uh, thevalleyprivate.com.au you can log on to for more information. Professor, thank you for coming on. I'm sure some listeners will be uh, taking some notes uh, this afternoon yeah. and uh, really appreciate the insights. No problems, but thanks very much for having me. Professor Richard Bidar, spinal neurosurgeon, joining us this week in the medical room. For the Valley Private Hospital Mulgrave, in the medical room returns next Sunday on 1116 SEN, Melbourne's home of sports.